Hey, good morning. Thanks for coming to a radio rap show at like 7 p.m. Yeah? <laughs> so I've spent the better part of uh, the last year in some amateur scholarship on love and heartbreak and what each does to your brain and body as they course through you or run you over or whatever. If you have unlimited data plan and you have essentially like an unlimited supply of boxed white wine, it is amazing what you can find on the intranet about love and heartbreak. So before we get into the meat of the evening, I just wanted to share with you guys like three of my favorite studies. Ready? Okay, this one might be familiar if you've already taken a class like as an undergraduate in psychology. The bridge study. Does that, is that a familiar term? I want you to say no because I want to be the person to reveal this to you. Fantastic. The bridge study. So this was an experiment done in the mid-70s that's usually discussed in terms of misattributed arousal. And here's the experimental design. You get two bridges. There's one that's low and sturdy, and then there's like a, a scary bridge, essentially. So it's something that's high and kind of shaky and suspensiony. You put a hot female researcher on each of those bridges, and you give her a clipboard or whatever, and she's got a survey. As male crossers of each bridge get about midway through, she stops them and says, oh, excuse me, do you have time to take a quick survey? And they say, yeah. <laughs> What's up? And then she gives them a very open-ended uh, survey. Uh, it's, it's an ambiguous set of images, and they're asked, essentially, to create a narrative that might link them. After they're done taking the survey, she says, thank you so much for your time. And um, if you have, like, I don't know, like any questions or whatever about the survey, like, here's my number. After this is conducted to an equal number of crossers on the sturdy bridge and on the high, scary bridge, the high, scary bridge crossers call her more often. And the idea is that they've misattributed those bodily sensations of like racing heart, fear, from the bridge to like, I must love her. <laughs> Which to me implies that like the best place to meet a guy is like at knife point. <laughs> you should call me. If you show a group of female research participants, a series of male faces, and you ask those research participants to rate those faces on their attractiveness, their ratings will correspond positively to that dude's sperm count, which blew my mind. <laughs> also, sidebar, um, I'm terrified at almost all times of getting sued for using non-copyrighted material because I work in hip hop. So I was at a coffee shop today Googling like handsome face man, <laughs> non-copyrighted image or like, you know, wiki commons, hot guy head. <laughs> and it was so difficult to find a guy that was hot that for one second I was like, God, I mean, are people gonna think I have bad taste if I can't find a hot guy? I think he's very hot, he's a rugby player somewhere. That a guy happened to walk by me who was very hot while I was looking and I was like, I don't have time for this shit. It is sound check in like 25 minutes. What if I just stopped that guy and said, I think you're hot. Can I take your photo? I'm a scientist. Well, not really, but I pretend to be one on the radio. And I'd stab him and I'd give him my number. <laughs> Thank you, CNN. 24-hour news cycle. It's a 24-hour news cycle. This actually was fascinating to me. So they recruit subjects of each gender. They attach sensors to the moving parts of their bodies. They play a simple beat. They ask those people to dance to it. And now what they're trying to figure out are like, what are the sexiest dance moves? But they want to make sure that they're isolating the movement alone, right? That potential respondents are not going to be distracted by the fact that a guy or girl is hot, or they like you know, their, their kicks, or, or they have a great hairstyle, or whatever. So they capture the data of the movement, and then they assign it, essentially, to a, a humanoid avatar. They make this avatar dance for 15 seconds, and respondents from the opposite gender evaluate the sexiness <laughs> of those movements. 
And they found out that as women are watching a 15 second clip of male dancing, that the movements that females rate highest and most attractive correspond to the testosterone levels in the saliva collected from those dancers were made out of magic and creepiness. <laughs> and that one of the indicators, essentially, for the best, sexiest male dance moves was in the movement of his right knee. <laughs> Which, A, what? And then B, I realized that when I, when I, um, when I started doing music, I hadn't actually gone to that many live shows. I'd been kind of an, a nerd in high school, so I hadn't like made a circuit of a lot of live performances. I didn't know concert culture very well. Some of the first concerts I went to were rap, but the other half was like indie rock. Where have you seen that? <laughs> Everywhere you ever go, right? I was like, that was my teenage years. It was like this, like, I have sperm. <laughs> okay, I admit that all of this research um, wasn't completely idle. So I make my living as a rapper. I work with a seven member collective named Doomtree that's based in Minneapolis. <laughs> I'm the one in the tank top. <laughs> It is this tank top. <laughs> That's messed up. Most of our shows look like that. It's rowdy, it's rugged, um, and we've been friends for a really long time, kind of stage diving inadvertently um, for the past 10 years. But of the seven people in that collective, I tend to write a lot of sad songs. Um, I've done that for a lot of years. Like they're, oh, they've been consistently pretty damn sad. I, I, I'm gonna welcome my, my cohort musically, Abby Wolf, to stage. We're gonna play one of those songs, yeah? Abby, will you join me? Yeah. Okay. So this is a song that I've performed with Doomtree on stages, and I've been lucky enough to travel the world with Abby performing uh, songs that sound a lot like this in a lot of countries. Your key, your key's still working. You can't train them more, I guess. Oh, each piece gets a burden, so we circle this so flame. Too much at stake, but too late to change. My nerves are shot, my reserves exhausted. It's a tired plot, but we bought it. Now we're lost between love and cholera, chakra and reed. It's such a sentimental novel, give you cavities. If it doesn't drop it to the bottom, may I take another kerosene? If you got it, something harder, built like a moth, you see. And I still get chills when you talk to me. But the years pass by, now we're twos and threes. And these thrills ain't as cheap as they used to be. The real asking, I can't say no. To this game with matches We've been lovers and strangers And friends who get angry Make mistakes and amends Brief moments of magic We forgive and forget And give in to attraction This whole thing depends on amnesia And magnets leaving for good Looking for better But I got this broken habit I keep gluing back together The fever the fire the feathers The fever defies measure And good sense won't venture Where the mob won't let it uh. Asking I can't say no I can't say no Just 
Passing on Just for your chapter I'll be more close I know it's madness To play these hearts It's like giving matches To paper To paper dolls It's just like Just like Or it's just like Just like just like giving matches to paper dolls. It's just dolls. like, just like, just like. Oh, it's just like, just like, just like giving matches to paper. If you're asking, then I can't say no. I can't say no. Just one more chapter. I'll be more close. I'll be more close. I know it's madness to play these eyes. To play these eyes. It's like giving matches to paper. To paper dolls, if you're asking me, then I can't say no. Just one more chapter, please. I'll be more closed. I know it's madness to play these ads. It's like giving matches to paper, to paper, to paper dolls. So, after like 10 years of performing songs like that, you know, it was a good, it's a great life on the road, but your knees start to hurt, and at some point it's like, God, let's fuck with major keys. <laughs> I'd really like to have a lifestyle that would be best expressed in major keys <laughs> for a while. So, in October of 2016, I contacted the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research at the University of Minnesota, and I said, hi, I'm a rapper who only writes sad songs. <laughs> I had a bad breakup. That happens to everybody. But I've tried all the like over-the-counter remedies, the time, the whiskey, the distance. I've dated other brilliant men, and every time I break up in this new relationship, this old love had come back like a laser-guided boomerang ghost, and I want to figure out how to get rid of it. And I'd read research online from this woman named Dr. Helen Fisher. She'd been working for a long time putting people in fMRI machines to try to find the exact coordinates of human love in the brain. And I thought, if I could find my love, I could pull it out. <laughs> so I talked to a researcher named Dr. Cheryl Ullman. Five, I don't know why she's not. She agreed to take me on. I wanted to do a little experiment, and she set aside some, some time in the scanner. I asked, hey, I'd like to get into your like, multi-million dollar machine, and I can offer you backstage passes to a rap show. And that felt fair to everybody. So she hooked me up with a set of forest green scrubs, which you can kind of see on my, my knee there. She said, all right, let's get you in the fMRI machine. I took off all my rings. I was told that I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't wear any panties with silver threads in them because they would heat up. <laughs> I got in the machine. And when I was inside, we repeated a design protocol that had been used in this Dr. Helen Fisher study. And it goes like this. You lie it on your back. There's a screen essentially on the ceiling of the fMRI machine. And it's going to display a couple of images to you. One of them showed my ex-boyfriend. So I'm looking at pictures of my ex. And the other is a control. So it's someone who I find attractive, someone who I've known for a long time, someone with whom I am familiar, and who, with whom I have a good rapport, but with whom I am not a love. So we're trying to isolate just the love alone. Afterwards, I got into the scanner and with these really beautiful images of, uh, of the anatomy of my brain. We could see it rotating in three dimensions. And we could maneuver it to look inside it and in between the two hemispheres. We could essentially inflate it so that we could see inside all of the folds and we could lay it flat in a view that Dr. Cheryl Ullman called the brain skin rug. And after we had those images of the anatomy itself, now we could start to look at the data that we had collected from each of those two circumstances, looking at images of the X and then images of the, of the control male. 
we could look at all of the activity. As you can see, that's kind of like a weather map, right? Like you have the, the map of the country and then the swirling, glitchy colors indicate where activity has been registered. And I could look at how my brain behaved in each of those two scenarios, right? So there's more activity here in the second view. That's of my, of my ex-boyfriend. And then the next step was to essentially do uh, an exercise in subtraction. So if we take my brain when it's looking at the pictures of my ex, we look, take all that activity, and then we subtract from it the activity that's happening in the images of the control. That allows us to remove the activity that you're always going to find in a normal functioning human brain, right? Sometimes your brain is just on because my eyes are open, so my visual cortex is seeing things and it's responding. My lungs have to keep functioning. My kidney is filtering even if I'm not actually thinking about it. But what we found was consistent with Dr. Helen Fisher's research, that there were a few areas of the brain that lit up, specifically and only when I was looking at those images. So here, I have a laser and I'm going to use it. Here, we have the anterior cingulate. Here, we have a center called the VTA, the ventral tegmental area. And this gold thing that looks kind of like a ram's horn, that's called the caudate. And that was exactly where we found the activation. And there it was. Cheryl sent me this image of my brain in love. And I got, it was more emotional. I was here, I was here in New York at a coffee shop and I got her email and I opened it up. I went, holy shit. Because in some way, even though of course I knew I was in love, why get in somebody's fMRI machine and write a decade worth of sad songs if you're not in love? But it felt like now I had proof. Does that make sense? I had proof physically. And also I felt a little bit like an assassin that like now I had my target. <laughs> So, the next step, now that I knew where the love was, was to try to eradicate it. And for that, I tried a technique called neurofeedback, which is sometimes used with people who are epileptic, sometimes used with people who have um, attention deficit disorder. But I found a woman who was willing to hook me up and to try it on me. And I don't have to explain to you what she explained to me over the phone because she's here today. So, I'm gonna turn I'm going to turn the stage over to Penny Jean Gracefire. Is my mic on? Excellent. Hello. I actually flew up here from Florida. That's how big of a Dessa and Abby fan that I am. <laughs> I am really excited to get to do this because Dessa has one of the most interesting brains I have ever gotten to put wires on and look at. And I've seen some interesting ones. Um, as a licensed mental health therapist, I have spent over 12 years trying to answer the most, in question, the most important question in my entire industry, which is, why can't people act right? <laughs> and Obviously, as one does, when you want answers to a question, you turn to science. And so in my years of studying the brain, I have learned that the brain really only does three things. It tracks information from your immediate surrounding environment. It looks for patterns in that information and tries to recognize patterns. That's the first thing it does. When it identifies and recognizes a pattern that makes sense or has a meaning contained in it, it tries to identify whether or not that pattern has anything to do with it. And then the third thing that it does is um, it tries to figure out if it can impact or change whatever that pattern information is, okay? So here's why this is important. Think about how you operate in the world. How do you work? You walk around, stuff happens, you try to figure out what it means, you try to figure out if it has anything to do with you, and then you try to figure out if you can impact or change what's happening in your environment to get some basic needs met, like food, water, relationships, whatever you're looking for, right? All that information in your environment that I'm talking about comes in many forms, tactile, vibration, etc. It also comes in waves. You know what these are? These are sound waves. Well, actually, this is a physical 
picture of a sound wave, a couple of sound waves. Sound waves are actually a, a mechanical vibration that your inner ear detects and then determines patterns and extracts information from that vibration. Light waves are also frequencies that contain information that your brain absorbs, detects, identifies, looks for patterns, right? Sound waves are physical and require a medium to carry them. Light waves are electromagnetic and do not require a physical medium. And you know what else is electromagnetic and doesn't require a physical medium? Radio waves. We're going to come back to that. So not only are you constantly taking in information and trying to determine what's happening in your environment, whether it's relevant to you, whether you can impact it, not only are you satellites, you're also radio stations yourself. You create and produce waves, electrical frequencies, okay? Well, how do we look at the electrical frequencies that you produce? We stick little sensors or electrodes on your head or in some places called hospitals, in your head, but I don't do those ones. I just put stuff on the outside, no craftsman drill involved. And we plug those wires into a little box we call an amplifier because it's actually amplifying the little frequencies so they can be big enough that we can take them apart, look at them, post analyze them, and turn them into information. Two of the things that we are looking for, two of the things that we are looking for in these EEG frequencies, anybody know what EEG stands for? Electroencephalogram. Electro means electrical, encepha means brain, and gram means picture. Literally a picture of the electrical activity in your brain, EEG. When we are looking at physical squiggles on the page, well, I guess these days is a digital screen. Thank goodness. You know, I've actually met people who spent years reading these huge printed reams of EEG. Yeah, I was born in the right time. <laughs> so when we're looking at the physical squiggles, we're looking for two characteristics from which we derive the majority of the information. We're looking at amplitude and frequency. Amplitude essentially meaning the size or how much power energy is in the signal the volume or the signal strength. And the second one, frequency, is how quickly or rapidly is it cycling up and down? How frequently does it cycle in a second? Guess what AM and FM stand for? <laughs> Amplitude and frequency modulation. So when a radio is put out information, when they put out signals, they are actually modulating elements of that signal to contain information. And this is how you can listen to different stations at different times, how they can play different things, how you can get different information. And if you don't like what the stations play in, what do you do? Change you change the channel. What if we could do that with our brains? Yeah? So one of the interesting things about brain waves is that you make a lot of different frequencies. You're producing a lot of different sizes and speeds of brain waves. And each of the different frequency speeds or sizes actually correlate to states or, in, or feelings or conscious experiences or it, degrees of engagement with your external environment, right? So for example, if you've got nice big slow waves and everything's going as expected, we're probably looking at sleep. If you've got a lot of really big slow wave information in places we don't expect it to be, at times we don't expect to see it, you might have a brain injury. If we have a lot of little fast, excited little fast waves in places and times we expect to see it, you're probably pretty engaged, pretty on point, playing, paying a lot of attention. I see a ton of beta happening right now. It's very exciting for me. So you're on point, but if you have a whole lot of beta, in places we don't expect to see it, at times we don't expect to see it, you might have anxiety or any other kind of fun neuroses like obsessive compulsive disorder. So parts of your brain can become more or less engaged, are supposed to become more or less engaged 
based on what's happening in your environment. So when things are occurring that you're supposed to be interested in or engage with, your brain's supposed to make faster, more interested in gauge waves. And when there's nothing happening, your brain's supposed to kind of chill out, conserve energy, and wait for something to engage it. And when you try to go to sleep, it's supposed to shift into an even slower state and chill you all the way out so you can go on the charger. So I was on this little internet website some of you may have heard of <laughs> called Twitter and came across this pithy little observation by this really interesting photographer, art historian person that I suggest you look up later. And it really kind of struck me because for me, a brain scan is a playlist. When I take a picture of your brain and I am, that's the wrong direction, and I am looking at what you have going on, I've essentially got your greatest hits in front of me. If you spend a whole bunch of time playing the blues, I'm probably gonna know. If you spend a whole lot more time on that really hyperneurotic dubstep channel, I will also probably know. <laughs> and what this allows for me to do as a clinician is to figure out what parts of your brain correlate to the functionalities that you're attempting to either work on or improve or calm down, and to what degree is your brain engaging, either hyper-engaging in certain frequency activity that keeps you really locked on to particulars, or what parts of your brain maybe are not engaging sufficiently so that you can actually in approach or co connect with whatever that particular is that you're interested in. So how does all of this relate to relationships? Okay. Think about it maybe like this. If you play one channel for a pretty long time, maybe at top volume, and you just sort of hang in there with it for a while, you learn all the songs, and then maybe you don't play it for a while, but it comes back on, is it really easy to kind of naturally remember how that, so that song or the, that genre of music, <coughs> that particular beat, that playlist? Yeah, we fall right back <coughs> into it because your brain prioritizes resources based on what we pay attention to. So if you frequently pay attention to a thing, or if a thing frequently draws your attention, your brain attempts to routinize and make efficient whatever neural pathways and or networks are required to engage with that. So if you keep thinking about the same person over and over and over, then your brain's gonna routinize and make super efficient and easy for you to continue thinking about that person when any little tiny thing that possibly even tangentially reminds you of them happens. And it's so hard to not keep going back and thinking about the same stuff. Well, how, how do we take a brain that's essentially playing that same song over and over and we get it to change the channel? <laughs> One of the things we can use are sound waves because your brain actually prioritizes incoming sound vibration. Remember I told you that um, sound is a physical medium? Essentially, it's a, it's a physical, tangible, sound waves are a physical and tangible experience that creates a vibration that your body totally keys into and uses to regulate central nervous system arousal. You don't turn off your ears when you sleep and your ears are 360 degrees. So that means it is a monitoring alert system that your brain has all the time telling you what's happening in your environment and whether or not anything has changed that you should pay attention to, right? So because your ears are right here, next to your temporal lobes, it goes straight into the bottom of your brain and then back right where your limbic structures are. Those limbic structures contain things like your amygdala and lots of other fun words, which essentially just means the parts of your brain that try to keep you alive. So those sound frequencies come in and your central nervous system is constantly modulating its arousal and its interest to changes in the sound waves in your environment all of the time. I mean, any of us have experienced this. You're hanging out at a party, there's a hundred people, it's super loud, things are happening, and across the room, you hear somebody's voice get high-pitched and a little angry. Almost all of us will pause just a minute and just make sure none of that stabbing that Dessa was talking about starts to happen, <laughs> even if it does improve their love life, at least. 
So because we are so tuned in, what we're able to do is identify the areas of your brain that are way too engaged or maybe not sufficiently engaged, and then create a sound feedback program that modulates pitch and tone specifically key to the activity of those brain areas that we're monitoring live. And when those brain areas start to behave a little bit more flexibly, they're able to shift more easily, they're able to modulate in ways that we would expect. When they start to match more of those expectations, the sound waves change and it becomes this feedback loop that simply mimics the feedback loop we live in all the time with the world around us. And your brain goes, whoa, and the second half of the story comes later. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So are you saying that when the brain prioritizes sound over touch and light, that like if at exactly the same time I touched your arm and I flashed a bright light at you and I went, yeep, that like your brain would prioritize the yeep? It would, huh. but it would also attempt to integrate simultaneously the yeep uh -huh. with the touch, right. with this visual scan of who you are, right. with an overall assessment of what your surroundings are, so that it can decide whether or not anything that just happened is concerning. When you are not working with rappers, um, like who, who are your usual clients? So I do a lot of work with people who have various mental health concerns. A lot of work with depression and anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder, as I mentioned. But essentially, this can help anyone who has any difficulty functioning. I was gonna say at all, because you know if you've got a brain, this could help you. But people who have actual difficulty with um, generalized functionality, say maybe people on the autism spectrum, people who have di dyslexia, people who have trouble with all sorts of sensory processing disorders, brain injury. And do you do it in their houses or do they come to you in a clinic? It really varies. I actually um, ran a neurotherapy clinic for about six years in Tampa. And so obviously we had a lot of fun machines and rooms and people came in and we did stuff. Um, these days I do a lot more on the road. So I go to a lot of people and I also do a lot of training. She actual like clinicians. A maturing artist. How, uh, yeah. <laughs> how, uh, how much do you have to pack? Like what, what do you bring? How many suitcases do you lug around with you while you're, <laughs> while you're going across the country to work with someone? I was complimenting Abby earlier on her, her serious schlepping capabilities with how much gear that she brought, because you actually outgeared me today. So, right, this is my, I've got like three boxes, <laughs> and I, my suitcase weighs 35 pounds. Like, how, because that's where the TSA charges you more. Like, you, you did it. Yeah. Right? Exactly 35. Yeah, exactly 35. <laughs> okay. I just happened to notice that it was a 35-pound suitcase. So, so it does everything that you need to do this job on the road listen fit in one let thing. me tell you something that has made this possible in the last 10 to 15 years technology has evolved to the point that I can take a handful of wires a little amplifier in my laptop put it in a backpack get on my motorcycle and go anywhere I want hook somebody up do a brain scan, interpret the information, and then in the same space with the same equipment, do the actual training or therapy. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Hashtag short film. Um, <laughs> we're gonna do it live on stage. So this is the deal. While we get set up to demonstrate a neurofeedback session, Abby Wolf, would you be game to play one of your tunes I would. <laughs> I would. I already got up. <laughs>
with you for a long time and I haven't heard that one and it kind of snuck up on me. But what a beautiful you, song. But you were there when all of that happened. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dessa. Oh, man. <laughs> Feeling. Okay. Penny Jean. Yes. Are you there? I am. Um, I have one thing to say to you publicly and then I have one thing to say to you singly. The public thing is the screen's down we're ready to go. The secret thing is do I have lipstick on my chin? Not even a little. Great. Okay. <laughs> I think we're ready. You want to just talk them through what's going on? I'm going to hold sure. still and you be the boss. Okay. Sure. You might be noticing some sounds. So I remember <laughs> earlier when I was talking about how we can create sound feedback protocols that actually reflect brain activity and modulate as your brain modulates itself and changes what it's doing. Well, what you're hearing right now is the precise sound feedback design that Dessa and I made together to train her brain. So Dessa got to listen to this for some hours out of her life. So you and I, when, when Penny Jean was kind enough, so I'm on the phone, right? I'm like, hey, we should have a long sleepover. <laughs> and you should help me fall out of love with this dude. Um, and she was like, okay. And so we went to my dad's house because he had a flat screen TV <laughs> and he has really good snacks. And so my dad lives in Florida. We went there and we sat almost as we are now, except I'm at my dad's house. We're looking at a flat screen TV. We can hear this kind of intermittent signal. And for days on end, essentially, morning and night, we did a couple of sessions. The idea being, like, you told me I don't have to think about anything right now, right? right? It's not like I'm thinking right. about Your another Your brain's dude. just doing what it normally does. So what the software does, what, what the EEG equipment combined with the software design does, is we select it out together the areas of our brain based on a bunch of published research that were claimed to have relevance to romantic feelings or engagement. So what parts of your brain 
help you or make you fall in love or keep you in love or what has to do with romantic love in specific, right? So what we did was we looked at all of that and we looked at Dessa's brain scans and we kind of cobbled together uh, uh, essentially Dessa's romantic resiliency protocol because we weren't trying to make her not be able to be in love <laughs> in spite of maybe what it felt like when she was trying to get out of it. We were wanting for her to have the flexibility and capability to engage in romantic feelings or relationships when it was reasonable or appropriate. And so that's what this... <laughs> I'm gonna ju jump in. Because initially, <laughs> Initially, I admit that it was more like, I think I think I came to you, I mean, I hope I, I sounded professional with it, but I was thinking more like, lobotomy. And she was like, no, maybe not. You um, might want that later. Yeah, you might need that later, exactly. You might need that later. So it was, can I try, I'm gonna try the analogy, but then you correct me if I F it up. It was like, instead of removing a part of your brain or fizzing it out with electricity, right? What we were trying to do is train it in the way that you would a muscle for strength and resiliency. So that in a pro, you know, when I am in a viable romantic relationship, those parts of my brain should remain engaged and active. And when I am not in a viable relationship, essentially and eventually, those parts should chill the fuck out, man. <laughs> so it has to do with an appropriate response to the environment. Does that sound right? That's completely correct. Yeah. And we just had to find the areas that were <clears throat> staying on all of the time regardless of what was happening. And when we did, the sounds that you're hearing are essentially increasing or decreasing in pitch depending on how much her brain was matching what we were looking for to do. So as her brain matched more of that flexibility or resiliency framework we were looking for, the pitches get higher. And as it matches less, the pitches get lower. So it is a regular, very sensitive, real-time response to exactly what her brain's doing. And why does that change her brain? Well, remember what we talked about originally? Your brain is going to track what's happening in its environment and it's going to ask three questions. Is there a pattern? Does it have anything to do with me? And can I impact it? All of those questions are answered by sounds that go up and down a pitch based on exactly what your brain is doing. And since brains are basically people, we're <laughs> always the most interested in whatever has to do with us. So there's a very natural recruitment process that occurs when these sounds go up and down in pitch. Okay, and I, you know, initially I'll admit, okay, sidebar. Yes. Um, is your thing not muted? Okay. So initially I, I had imagined that there would be a more active component. Do you know what I mean? Like I thought I'd have to think about something in an effort to, to trigger the learning. But then I thought about the very little bit that I knew as like a lay person with any biofeedback or even just general associative learning. So when you think of like Pavlovian dogs, right? It's not like they had to consciously think about associating dinner and bell. That was something that physiologically they associated without knowing that that was an objective of anybody at all. And even, even the silly stuff like, um, like the, dance, the dance thing that I was mentioning earlier, right? Certainly as a, I identify as a cisgendered heterosexual woman, I'm not like, what's up with that right knee? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, let me say, can I, I talked about, I talked about the male, I'm gonna do the female version too. So, Abby, do you, can I use you as my humanoid avatar? Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, before, before, yeah, perfect. Before we begin, yeah, you're perfect. You're a puppeteering doll. And I'm gonna, uh, quick note, do we have an HDMI visual feed? Okay. Um, before we before we maneuver at Abby here as a as a como se llama a marionette, one of the things that researchers noticed was that female lap dancers earn more when they're ovulating by a really significant margin. That was at least the findings of one study. You know what's funny is that everybody in the room except for you, uh, like everyone's like, I can't believe it, and three people were like, Yep, that makes total sense. <laughs> Get over it, science. What? Welcome to 2017. Please. <laughs> the other thing that was fun is sometimes it's just fun to read about the way that scientists talk about sexual content, right? Because they have to, you know what I mean? They have to sterilize it. And so, okay, uh, it's so fun. Three types of movement. 
contributed independently to high quality female dance. <laughs> so Abby, I'm gonna list them one at a time. Hip swing. Show me a little, swing? I don't know, man. What's a? I think that's good. Yeah, good, okay, so keep that going. You don't stop that. Okay, so this is a medium good female dancer, but you know what? Let's uh, amp it up a little bit. <laughs> what does this mean? Asymmetrical movements of the thighs. I feel like thighs are connected to the hip bone. Like, don't you know this one? <laughs> That's how I dance. <laughs> <laughs> and intermediate levels of asymmetrical movements of the arms. Oh, intermediate, please. <laughs> I don't know. Science. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Abby, will you do me? I need, I need a bribe for a guy. We, there's candy in that bag. Okay, all right. Can I have, I, I realize that this is a big ask and this isn't like a boozy enough club. This is not a club. Um, to pull it off, I think we all know that. Is there one guy just for one second who would be willing to stand up with Abby just for one second to do the knee dance so we can see what two ideal human beings look like in the throes? This guy. Of yes. And I chose for you a dove solid milk chocolate heart. Okay, ready? Can for later, somebody who for has later, a, for later. Somebody who has this cell phone. I just, I really want, I want to capture this moment. Okay. I'm just waiting for the knife to come out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Perfect human dance motion. Go. <laughs> this is a party. Side side. <laughs> And we're like basically we're doing the same. And kind then what do I? Yeah, you okay. got the hip and swing down just better kind than of I All did. of us. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys so okay. much. Thank you, Kenny G. Chocolate apple. Thank you. Okay, so I do this like sleepover for science at my dad's house, and um, you know, and I'm I'm set up essentially in his living room, and I'm listening to harps for a lot of weeks in a row in an effort to eradicate this vestigial feeling, right? It's not serving anybody any purpose anymore. I learned the word perseverant that week. I do these sessions and then um, Penny Jean, she leaves and she, you, have a, you have a vanity plate on your car that says EEG teacher, which to me is baller. <laughs> Penny, Jean, Penny, Penny Jean rolls out and, um, and I'm barefoot in my dad's driveway and I'm like, thanks Penny Jean. And um, my dad really likes you. And he was like, and also I think my dad felt like, you know, it was science, like we're doing shit. You know what I mean? Like we got a project and that feels good. And so I think he was pretty bummed to see Penny Jean leave. <laughs> it was very sweet. And, um, and he was like, so, you know, what do you, what do you think about the, the project? And it's easier to talk to my dad about like my broken love life through the science lens than it is for him to be like, why can't you get over, dude? Like that's not okay to ask in the living room, right? But him being like, what do you think about the project is fair game. And I said, I kind of hedged, to be honest. I was like, um, you know, I'm eager, to, I'm eager to head back into that fMRI machine to see if there's any change in my brain. And his wife is like, seriously, that's how you're answering that question? How do you feel? And I hedged, I admittedly, I, I hedged her, her too, and then I got, um, I got an email eventually from Cheryl, and she said, you know, we, we, we scanned together again, you know, so I did exactly the same protocol, look at the dudes, look at the dudes, but now I'm after the experiment, right? So I go and I, I visit with her again, we do exactly the same protocol, and there's no dot. And she says, essentially, um, your brain has stopped favoring dude A, which is how I had labeled my ex-boyfriend, <laughs> because they wanted to preserve the fact that it was single blind. Like, she didn't know which guy was which, right? Because we didn't want that to influence the potential results. So she says, I think this is the, the desired effect. Yes? And then my real friends, you know, my, my close <laughs> companions, <laughs> who I share my secrets with, you know, and who I stay up late with and tour with and, 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 um, and in whom I confide. People like Abby ask, dude, how are you, what, what are you doing? I'm freaking out. <laughs> because I did feel really different. I mean, first of all, harps were really weird to listen to now because I've been, <laughs> but also it felt like, 
Like, I did feel different. In some ways, I felt like I had exactly the same list of feelings. If someone was like, make an inventory of the way that you feel about this guy. The actual list of feelings wouldn't have been that different. There's love, and there's anger, and there's tenderness, and attraction, and resentment, and you can go down that list. It was the same inventory, but it was as if they'd been resequenced. It was like this benevolence had floated to the top. There was amity, whereas other negative feelings had been featured before. And in some way, I know that that sounds like a small thing, to have all the same feelings, but resequenced. But it felt like the most important thing. It felt like, if I told you I'm going to anesthetize you, and I'm also going to take out your wisdom teeth, it would really matter to you the sequence in which I did those <laughs> things. So it felt crucial. I felt different. I wanted to call the dude and be like, you should get this done too. <laughs> I felt grateful, I felt different, I felt changed. And I also, irrespective of like my subjective experience of it and whether or not I felt like I was in love or how my love life was going, I also just felt philosophically privileged. Like I had done this investigation of what love and romantic connection really was, you know? Like I got to, the scientists at the, at the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research, a guy named Phil and Andrea and Cheryl, who we saw before, they were so sweet and they printed out on a 3D printer my caudate, one of those anatomical regions that's associated with love. Like, I got to hold love in my hand. My love from my brain. And it was like, Real love isn't a bouquet or a heart-shaped chocolate. Real love is an absolutely hideous set of ram's horns that is buried deep within the center of your brain. <sighs> deep <laughs> within the center of your brain. Okay, I am more than overdue for a cocktail. So I think what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna, if you're game, I'd just like to take, if there are any, I'd like to take questions from the audience, if anybody has any. And I think, uh, I think Jennifer, do you have a microphone so that people can be heard if they have a question to ask? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. This is that microphone. Uh, okay, so the, so the first question, I'm going to say this, first of all, the first question for those of you viewing at home wasn't, did you really design an experimental protocol that mimicked the storyline of Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind? The first question was, is that a pinata? <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say this, credit, because I am candy oriented, because you'll notice that technically, there's no reason for candy to be part of this event. And I build it, like, like it's like featuring Abby Wolf and Penny Jean Gracefire and candy, ready? This is the deal, I'm gonna toss these hearts to you as if it were a pinata. <laughs> but I want you to share some with all of your row. Catch, don't look away. I know your name I mentioned in the bathroom, it's yeah, there you go. Okay, <laughs> next question. <laughs> One over there. Again, oh. Are you writing major key songs now? I did write, I did write, I mean it was, the question was did you write a major key song now? Um, I wrote a sad one but it was about free will and not about the guy, because after this experience I was like, we don't actually control anything. <laughs> it was just, so it's a solid almost, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Hey man. Uh, so first off, thanks for doing this, uh, it's been really intriguing. Thanks, thanks for coming. Um, so just two really quick questions. One related to your auditory sessions in Florida. Yeah. Uh, so just by the couple of minutes of listening to that, personally, that for whatever reason gave me severe anxiety <laughs> listening to some of those. So I guess my first question to, to your lovely scientist is, uh, is there any reason for that or, or is the reason why your harp strings cause me even greater anxiety or <laughs> what have you. I love your music, by the way. But, and, then, and then number, number two is... Uh, What's your second question? Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, number two is actually, uh, for those that potentially are hearing impaired, have there been any other research using other senses outside of sounds that potentially have been looked into 
you know, obviously you mentioned hearing comes first, but touches, lights, does, right. does that tend to quell whatever feelings? Is it okay if I super quickly interject and then I turn it over to you? Yeah. Um, the <laughs> no interdisciplinary rap neuroscience candy booze show uh, <laughs> is complete without the perfunctory AV challenge. We had one today. And that challenge was um, that the neurofeedback sessions also involve a visual component that we couldn't quite get on the screen. But we're gonna do after, if people wanna kick it and have some candy and cocktails afterwards, we're gonna boot it up so that people can really see what that brain looks like rotating in three dimensions. Okay, now can I turn it over to you, Penny Jean? So, as much as I would love to mess with you and tell you that there's something terribly wrong with you just because those sounds made you anxious, in reality, it was a very logical response from your brain. Because remember what your brain tries to do. The very first thing it does is it looks for a pattern in the information's environment. So if the sound pattern of those particular sounds were keyed to the behavior of Dessa's brain, they would have absolutely no meaning or pattern for your brain. And one of the questions I experience quite frequently from people who I train to do neurofeedback on other people is, if I'm sitting here in this room listening to these sounds, am I getting trained too? Well, the sounds are key to the brain of whoever's hooked up to the electrodes. So I've actually had a number of people tell me that they find the feedback sounds to be annoying or irritating. Because if you cannot, well, there's two reasons. Reason number one, if you cannot cognitively or emotionally detect a pattern, if it just sounds like, you know, sounds going up and down, this isn't music, what's happening? I don't get this, right? That can be annoying or a little anxiety inducing. But the other reason is that we often confuse annoying with difficult to ignore. And so in actuality, if someone tells me, oh, these sounds are a little irritating or annoying to me, the first thing I do is I say, good. I'm clearly recruiting your brain's attention and it can't ignore this. But what we could do is possibly choose some different instruments or pitch and we can try to cobble together a feedback sound that maybe you find less irritating. Can I put you on the spot? I know you don't have a mic, so maybe just you know, shake your head or nod. Um, are you going to leave? <laughs> as soon as this is over? No. He said no. Second question. Um, nope, sidebar first. It had not actually, I don't think I've ever, yes, yes, <laughs> pause. Oh, oh, hey. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Oh, man, if you guys haven't had one before already, I'm just gonna do a knee balance and a thing, perfect. If you guys hadn't already had a chance to visit the bar, we had an awesome cocktail that was designed just for the evening by a bartender, my favorite from my neighborhood. Um, his name is Tom Athe, and it has crushed roses on the top, and it has a special concoction of um, the bitters to make it kind of bittersweet, like heartbreak. And dude wrote a better essay than most of those that I usually write to accompany and explain the drink, which made me excited, proud, jealous, and concerned. <laughs> Grab one. Also, if you've already had one, they came with a little napkin. You might have seen, and on the napkin, there is printing. Uh, if you read the column in the New York Times, Modern Love, you may have read, you know what I'm talking about already, you may have read that there was a writer um, who talked about taking a particular survey that has 36 questions in it that are designed to be answered by a couple sitting across the table from one another who can see one another, answered in sequence to build interpersonal closeness. So you got a question on your napkin. If there's somebody exciting that you don't want to stab but would like to say hello to, you should ask them on the napkin. Okay, no you're not leaving. Step one, what is your name? Andrew, Andrew. Um, it, I've never actually listened to neurofeedback signal when I'm not getting neurofeedbacked. And so it didn't occur to me, like I noticed sometimes that the, the sound isn't musical to me, but it does have kind of like a, you know when you watch a screensaver? Gee, a good one. Uh, and you kind of go like, oh, is it gonna hit the corner? Oh no, it's not. <laughs> it has that feeling. There's kind of a, a very, very lightly, a very lightly kind of hypnotic vibe. Not that I was losing control, but very often when Penny Jean was like, we're done, I was like, we ain't done. It's, oh shit, it's been 25 minutes. Do you want to do it afterwards so you can see if it's an, yes! Okay, Andrew's in. <laughs> I volunteered him. Okay, other, other questions? We've got some on starboard. Okay. 
Oh, good run. Thank you. Uh, question for both of you, actually. Um, does what you've seen about getting brains to train themselves undermine the way that you feel about virtue in general? Does it make you feel like doing good doesn't count if you can just build good back into your brain later? Are you a Kantian? <laughs> no. Are you a utilitarian? No. Is he? Your, your girl just pointed at you like, hell yeah. He reads Bentham and Mills every night before he goes to bed. Totally teasing. Um, I think that's a super interesting question. I, do you want to field that one first? And actually, I'd be interested in what you have to say about that too, because you and I had some drunk conversations about like, where does love live? You guys go first. Just so I'm clear, are you asking whether or not there's any virtue in doing good? Or what do I think about virtue in general as does a result? It, is it discouraging when you think about trying to do good when that's hard, when you know that tinkering is available? So that's a great question. So what I have frequently experienced, let's go back to my original question, why can't people act right, mm. is that there are usually a whole cascade of experiences that people have throughout their life that create these barriers to their ability to engage or connect with other people, right? And then there's this also this constellation of variables, um, whether or not you've had a brain injury, whether or not you were born with a degenerative myelination disease, whether or not you can read facial expressions, right? That also help us figure out how to modulate how we interact with other people. And so how we would define good if we were to define it as connectivity, the ability to create and sustain a connection with other sentient humans that seems to be positive and healthy, there are so many ways that that's already terribly difficult for people, and then you layer life on top of it. It's, it's so stressful, and many of us go all the way to the end and pass over the Rainbow Bridge and never quite get it. So the fact that there's something like this that makes it possible for people who might not actually have that ability at some point, I find personally really encouraging. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, and Shane, let's, let's do the next one. We got one there and then one here, yeah? But if you're game to kick it afterwards, I do feel weird about, I don't, I, I don't know where the hell free will lives. I'm becoming a soft determinist for real, not for a joke. And that's a bummer. I'm super glad the technology and the knowledge and the expertise exist because I think it makes life better. But how and when do we congratulate ourselves for agency, which becomes more significant on a moral sphere? I don't know, man. <laughs> Who's got the mic? Oh, sorry. Hit um, what are the hey. tones tracking, the feedback, the harp sounds? Uh, what are they responding to The tones in your brain? are specific. So what we, we did was we picked a bunch of brain areas and we kind of cobbled them together into um, a whole pile of metrics that we were tracking, the amplitudes and the frequencies and all that. So we got a pile of numbers that were changing in real time. And what we were looking for was whether, was what percentage of those numbers were coming within sort of a typical or expected range. So as the percentage of typical activity increased, so each little sound, each note up, was another percentage point. In pitch, you mean? Yes. Each, each pitch up, each step, was another percentage point. So essentially, as her brain fluctuated and oscillated and changed, we were giving it very sensitive feedback how closely it was matching those expected parameters or not. So the higher the tone, the lower the variance? Correct. And so, so, for, so for cats who don't have who don't have an edge up on it. Like I used to work in, um, I used to work as a medical technical writer before I was a rapper and my field was cardiac technology. So I wrote some of, some of the implantation devices, like um, defibrillators, the kind that you implant or pacemakers, right? And so if you think of, let's see, from your perspective, <clears throat> heart rate, if this is doom, 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 there are some times when you should be at dum, 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 you know what I mean? If you are in a fight or flight relation. Uh, re <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for coming out. No. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, there. <laughs> If you're in a fight or a flight, 
scenario, um, you should have a right? And if you are, uh, I don't know, like in that movie The Abyss, you know, where they get submerged in cold water and they have to like be swum to the other submarine, then you should be at a doom, 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 doom. But your body has to respond appropriately. Part of its job is to figure out what the metabolical ask is, right? So bradycardia, that means the really slow heartbeat. Tachycardia means the really high heartbeat. But a lot of implanted pacemakers, what they do is they measure it all the time, right? And say, whoa, whoa, whoa. This person got way too... This person got way too fast for no reason. They're gonna have a heart attack, right? Or whoa, 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 this person got too slow. So they try to keep you in that sweet Goldilocks zone. Similarly, for the parts of my brain, like the loving parts, just the loving parts, Penny Jean created this protocol where we're monitoring the activity just there. And we're comparing it to how other healthy brains work. So other 35 and a half year old right-handed females. How are those parts of their brains usually operating in healthy individuals? And whenever mine went nuts, it wouldn't get any feedback. But when it kind of moved to this sweet spot, it would be given a Snickers bar, or in this case, a little harp tone. So it, that was how the feedback was kind of working. Is that, uh, yeah, okay. That is completely correct. Ooh. Okay, let's do, let, can we do this one? Yeah, do, and one, and, one and two, and then we'll end it. Is that okay? Okay, I saw your hand up, for, okay. Thank you. So, um, my question is, do you miss it? And um, <laughs> because you mentioned eternal sunshine and the spotless mind, and you, say, and you continue to write in minor key, and is it a good thing to have eliminated this thing that is clearly something that you produced that's essential to who you are? Um. I don't know what the cartoon is where it's like I'm becoming my mother where I have like half an anecdote and then I start on it <laughs> and then I find myself alone in the sea. Um, something about like a, cart like a dog sits on a nail and it doesn't move and somebody's like, that's because it doesn't hurt enough yet. So for the first five years, I didn't call, I didn't, I didn't look up anything online. I wrote good songs and songs I'm proud of and I, I wouldn't unwrite. It was 12 years. So... It, was, it became too painful. I mean, I know this whole thing is like, it's a very jokey night and it should be, right? I, this is an entertainment gig. I'm not, I'm not trying to work out my inner problems with you. But, <laughs> but yeah, like it just became painful enough that the scale tipped, because it did feel integral to me. And to be honest, I mean, you do anything long enough, I think in my experience, and you sort of integrate it to your identity. Like I have asthma and I can write really good and I love this dude <laughs> you, you know it became like one of the things that I would list about myself to myself but after a while I was I was I was getting um sushi and uh I was like at a one all you can eat buffet and I was in my car and it was raining and um and the phone rang or something and I don't know if I'd hoped it was him when I turned it over that kind of thing and it was just such like an adrenal surge that I was like dude, you have to find a way to get rid of this because it's fucking you up, you know? So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I had it for the nine or ten years. And like I said, you know, I, I, still, I still feel a connection. So I don't, in, in an hour arc of storytelling, you know, it's like, I used to love him and now I don't because Penny Jean and I kicked it at her sleepover at my dad's house and we had Twizzlers. Like, that is an overstatement. First of all, the, the Bill Nye in me wants to say that, like, fMRI technology in and of itself is highly variable. It might be the case that if I did this five more times, we'd get different results, right? So I am also only one person, and that's way too small a sample size for absolutely anything statistically significant to occur. What it can do, I think, is say, huh, this is kind of interesting, this singular case study. This might warrant more investigation, and I wouldn't say any more in a science level, but as a human level, of course, you know, it feels different, yeah. Okay, one more question, and then I think we're gonna do another song, and then Andrew's gonna become a new man, we're gonna name him afresh. <laughs> okay, so I just wanna tell you before I ask that I'm 14 years old, but I think that everyone is wondering this, how do you get rid of loving someone if you don't have these resources? Like, how can you, I don't, I can't just find this cool, like, motorcyclist, like, <laughs> brain lady, like, I'm 14 years old, I don't have a job, I don't have money, I don't have resources, but, like, I'm gonna start falling in love soon, so what the hell am I supposed to do? I, 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 think, I think I can help with that. First of all, okay, I'll say, I'll say two things. I mean, some of it, I'm just like, 
Yeah, you're right. Um, some of it's just... <laughs> you are guaranteed pain. <laughs> I meant that to be deep, and you guys all laughed. <laughs> and that sucks. But I mean, just by virtue of being a human being and alive, you are guaranteed pain. And you are sometimes guaranteed pain in a way that corresponds to the extent to which you render yourself available to love and be loved. But also, you happen to know a motorcycling neurofeedback technician right now, and I have a serious feeling that you're gonna, you'll trade numbers. But yeah, I usually I feel like it just goes away after a while. That's my honest answer. I feel like for most human beings, you just get over it. I don't know. I don't know, I'm the last person to ask. Good luck, <laughs> I like you. Okay, before we wrap this, can you please help me thank Penny Jean Grace Fire for coming all the way home. <laughs> Abby Wolf, my compatriot and music maker. WNYC in the green space for having us. Doomtree for letting me tell this story and use their picture all the time. And Becky Hoffman, wherever you are, for wrangling this thing. Okay, we're going to close out with a song, and then afterwards we're going to kick it and drink. So hang out if you can.
I didn't know that was possible in this room. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. <laughs> 